If you have your hard copy this evening of the material, you can open it up to the eighth chapter and the fourth paragraph. That is where we left off last. So, chapter eight, the the fourth paragraph, or number four. When we were last here, we finished addressing Isaiah 53, 6 with reference to the statement, punishment due to us, which we should have borne and suffered being made sin and a curse for us. And in particular, you remember the document is referring specifically to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look back up at the beginning of the statement. This office, the office of his priesthood, the Lord Jesus did most willingly undertake, which that he might discharge, he was made under law and did perfectly fulfill it, and underwent the punishment due to us. Look in your Bibles again to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6. Isaiah 53, 6. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. If you move down in that chapter to verse 10, you see, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As the result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities." very straightforward, sacrificial talk with regard specifically to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to take you back to the document for just a moment, and I want you to notice that they use the phrase, punishment due to us. Do you see that there? Due to us. Now, if you were reading through this entire document, starting clear back in chapter 1, in the context of the document, how must you define the pronoun us? How must you define it? Okay, how do you know? Say that again, Walter. The suffering of death was not conditional or unconditional for Okay, it was not unconditional for everyone. How do we know that from this document? Have we addressed that at all? We have. If you have the hard copy, I won't go back on the slide, but I'll tell you where specifically it is at. It's in chapter 3 of the document. And it's in the sixth paragraph. Chapter three, chapter three deals with um, God's decree. And in that sixth paragraph, there is this statement, which is the last phrase of the paragraph. Neither are any other redeemed by Christ or effectively called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved 
but the elect only. So whenever you come in this document and you come to various phrases or pronouns here, and it, you'll see it all through the document. We've seen it already in this chapter and it'll be in the future and uh, we'll see it again in this chapter. Uh, you'll come to those statements, us, and they always in the context refer to the, as you mentioned, Gail, elect only. Chapter 6. Do you have the hard copy there? Do you, you can look it up. I don't have that right in front of me. I can look it up for you. Uh, which of those verses? Is that what you're saying? No, he wants to know was the, what was the specific reference. If you go and you look at that, uh, Walter, if you look at that six, that whole uh, chapter and that whole entire paragraph deals primarily with that subject. And there's multiple references there. Now, they do reference the, the non-elect, if I remember right there, at the end of that. Yeah, there, I can actually, if you would like, put it up on the overhead there. I pulled it up here. I think that's it there. If you want to take a look at those references right quick. So you can see from the document itself, and what I want us to be able to do is understand how it is that they are defining these as we go through and note the consistency through it. Now, I want to call your attention in the Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Notice very specifically the paragraph speaks of Christ being made sin and a curse for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 is the reference that they list. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And really, in this context, as you're looking at Scripture there, what verse 21 is doing is explaining to us how it is that God, in verse 19, is able to not count the trespasses of the world against the world. Take a look back up to verse 19. Namely, the text says, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So someone might ask, how is it that God did not count the trespasses of those in view here, and the word world is used, against them. And the answer comes to us in that 21st verse. He made him, that is Christ, to, and notice here, uh, who knew no sin, that speaks of his sinless perfection, to be sin on our behalf. And actually, the more literal translation of this would be, he made him who knew no sin, sin. The word to be, a phrase to be, is not in the Greek. And what is in view here is the fact that Christ received in his account, on his account, our sin. It's sacrificial trans, um, language here. It's similar to the Old Testament. 
And you remember whenever a leader in the Old Testament sinned, the leader was responsible for taking, according to Leviticus, a male goat. And he had to take that offering down as a sin offering. And you remember what he had to do. He had to put his hands on his head, right? And as he did that and he confessed his sin, that depicted a transference of the sin to the male animal. The people that committed a sin unintentionally, they had to take a female one down, and they did the same thing, and then the animal was sacrificed. And it depicted the transference of sin to the animal. And in reality, we know that's not what was happening because it was a picture of what God ultimately would do in Christ. And Paul is addressing that here. And again, notice this, verse 21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So the word our here, the pronoun our, is going to have to be understood back up in verse 19 as being related to the word world. Does that make sense? This is, and it's critical in understanding this. Notice in 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Paul is simply saying, you know, we have the ministry of preaching that message of reconciliation there. Therefore, he says, we're ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. For us. And take this back even a little bit farther in the text now. Go back, if you will, with me to verse 14. Paul's still speaking about his ministry here. He says in verse 14, For the love of Christ controls us. He's not talking about his own personal love for Christ there. He's talking about God's love, Christ's love. And whenever you look over to Romans 5, 8, God commended his love toward us in this in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? So Paul has in view here Christ's death. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all. That is, Christ, being one, died for all. Therefore, all died. There is the big question. Who is the all there? Is that every individual in the world? Is that each person in the world? By far, the majority of individuals that come to this text understand that as being the case. And if you do that, when they do that, they without real realization, are actually throwing great confusion into the person of the Godhead. And we understand that because of this immediate context. Why? Because we already understand from verse 19 what? That those for whom Christ has died, their trespasses are not what? They're not counted against them, are they? We know this is speaking of those for whom Christ died because it is Christ's death that's in view over this text. If he died for them, God credited their sin to Christ's account. And because of that, he's not going to count the sin to their account any longer. To their account, he's going to credit Christ's righteousness. 
That's from verse 21 too. See that there? So that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. If we go back even now to verse 14, the text goes on and says, Therefore all died. So take a look at these two statements together. One died for all, Christ died for all, therefore all died. What could he mean whenever he's talking about therefore all died and adding that and understanding that in the light of the fact that Christ died for all? Well, you remember a couple of different texts. For instance, you remember Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul made a profound statement there with regard to his unity with Jesus Christ. And he said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. And the idea of being crucified meant you were put to death. Paul is saying in Galatians 2.20, I have been put to death with Christ. Then he went on to say, nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. You notice in that text, Paul said that, one, he was in union with Christ. He said also, that Christ died for him there, Galatians 2.20, who gave himself up for me, right? He also mentioned Christ's love there, did he? Who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now go back over here to 2 Corinthians with me for a moment. As a matter of fact, also, you can look at Romans chapter 6 and verses 1 through 7, and there also Paul identifies the elect with the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And also in Romans chapter 6, the elect with the resurrection of Christ. Notice verse 15 here. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, he says in verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. The only way you can understand the world here has to be with regard to the world of the elect that consists of people from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation, right? According to the book of Revelation, and you can Go over there and take a look at that uh, in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. So, whenever we come back to the document again here, and we're looking at this mediation of Christ insofar as his office of high priesthood is concerned, he offered himself to God for our sins on our behalf. He offered up his own body as the sacrifice, didn't he? And it was for the elect alone. Because there are certainly people that God is counting their trespasses against them, isn't he? Has there been? Will there be? Absolutely. And there are right now those who are are in their sin and will never be otherwise. And we know that specifically from Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, because there, there will be a resurrection, as we have looked at before, to judgment. And they will be cast into the lake of fire, which Revelation 20 refers to as the second death. 
death. Let's go back to our document. Christ became sin for us. Not that he became a sinner, not that he became sinful, but God charged to his account our sin and punished Christ, poured his wrath out on Christ instead of us. Thus, satisfying God's wrath on behalf of God's people, right? You can see that right there again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And just another note, and, and I like to point this out because in verse 21, there is that English word there, might. And what does that conjure up in the minds of an Arminian? Probability, right? And the possibility that, well, it might not happen. If you don't believe, then you're not going to have the righteousness of God charged to your account. There's an element of truth in that, isn't there? Because we are justified by faith. We have righteousness credited to our account through the instrumental means of faith. So it's not that that is in itself untrue, but what is meant by the individuals in that camp is that, well, a person might not. God was only attempting this. That's complete, again, ignorance of this context, because Paul already said, not counting their trespasses against them, right? He, God isn't going to not count and then count it against them. Does that make sense? God is not a man, he said to Saul, or Samuel said to Saul, that he should lie or that he should change his mind, right? The word might in the Greek is a purpose statement here. And it really means God did this in Christ so that he could do this in you. What did he do in Christ? He charged our sin to him so that he could charge the righteousness of Christ to our account. That's what might means here. It's a purpose statement. Speaking of God's intention, what he was doing. Could you imagine for a moment the disaster that would be created in an understanding of the Godhead, if he charged to Christ sin that he later punished in the individual. That's, that would be catastrophic. Impacting the Godhead. Take us completely out of the picture. It would be the Father completely undoing everything that the Christ that Christ had come to do right Christ came to save those according to John chapter 6 and save all of those that the father had given him right and how is it that he did that he said in John 6 this is the bread is my flesh that I give for the life of the world right and I'll save them through my death, paraphrasing really much of what he was saying in John 6 there, through my death I will save them. They will have eternal life. I will raise them up. Who's them? All those that the Father gives me. I will raise them up. So, again, whoops, stressing 
uh, the importance of understanding that in this particular document as they continue on here. He is a curse for us. And we've actually looked at that text before, and they're referring to it again. Um, it is from Galatians chapter 3, right? They don't reference it right now in this particular document. At this point, they have before. But what does Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 tell us? I think Walter quoted this text a, a couple of weeks ago. Whenever you get it there, Walter, would you read it for us again? Galatians 3.13 Christ <clears throat> redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's right. <clears throat> he be, it, this again is very similar to the statement, he became sin on our behalf, right? Here, he became accursed on our behalf, for us, in our place. Could it be the whole world that's in view here? It couldn't be. It couldn't be. It has to be those only for whom Christ died, those who are the elect. Enduring most grievous sorrows, the text goes on to say, in his soul. And whenever you look at Matthew 26 and Luke 22 you'll, and 27, you'll remember there that Jesus said, you know, that his soul was grieved to the point of death. And most painful sufferings in his body, he was crucified and died and remained in the state of the dead, yet saw no corruption. And that was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, wasn't it? That his body saw no corruption. You remember that? The reference they gave or give here is from Acts chapter 13, verse 37. If you turn over to Acts 13, 37, and you can look at that text, but you'll see that the Apostle, is pre the Apostle Paul is preaching a message there, and in particular he's speaking of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and talking about the fact that he did not see in his body corruption. Peter actually used the same Old Testament reference that Paul used whenever Peter preached his message in Acts chapter 2. And it's from Psalm chapter 16, in that he, uh, God speaking there ultimately of Christ, would not allow his body to see decay, would not see de uh, corruption. On the third day, he rose from the dead with the same body, the same body. And and what they're conveying in the document here is he had a physical body as a man. That body underwent literal death. And on the third day, it underwent a literal resurrection to immortality. It was an immortal body. It was a body and it is a body now that will not suffer death again. It will not suffer sorrow again. It is the same kind of body that you and I one day will be resurrected in, those who believe in Christ, right? It'll be a tangible body, as we said before, as this particular section is dealing with the fact that Christ was two natures, wasn't he? He was and is God and is man. As a man, he has a body. And that body is not right here, right now. Instead, as the document will go on to say, it is in heaven with God. Yet, he is God as well, and as God, he is with us presently, isn't he? That's how we, as Christians, 
can explain to others who would inquire of us, well, how is it that Jesus is in heaven and how is it that he's with you too? No problem. Not a problem at all. He is with me as God. He is in heaven as Christ the man. Not an issue with God and not an issue with the people of God. The text goes on. He was raised with the same body in which he suffered, with which he also ascended into heaven, and there sitteth at the right hand of his Father. Go with me to one of the references given concerning his resurrected body, chapter 20 of John, verse 25. John 20 and 25. Let's back up for a moment so we can get this context to verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So on one of the uh, preceding appearances of Christ, Thomas wasn't with the other apostles. So the other disciples were saying to him in verse 25, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, and notice his words, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I want you to notice he's looking for a very specific characteristic of Christ here, isn't he? A human body, isn't he? And he wants to be able to see the wounds and fill them with his hand, isn't he? And then, verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And I love verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger. Stop right there for a moment. What does it tell you about not only Jesus being human, but what else does it tell you about him right here? He's divine still, isn't he? Because he knew what Thomas had said. That's the implication of the text, isn't it? And see my hands, and reach here your hand, and put it in to my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered rightly and said to him, My Lord and my God. In other words, I can see your body. I see the wounds. I know you are God as well. Right? Beautiful picture. He's raised with the same body. Even the book of Revelation, whenever John sees Christ in heaven, sees him as a lamb. What? Do you remember? Slain. That's right. Again, the implication being wounds in Christ's body. He's seated right now at the right hand of his Father, making intercession, and shall return to judge men and angels at the end of the world. Christ's intercession for his people is his very presence before God right now on our behalf. It's not that he's in heaven constantly, eternally petitioning the Father on our behalf. That's not what's conveyed there. He's not verbally, so to speak, in prayer making intercession for us. His presence there on our behalf is the intercession that is in view. You can see that whenever you look over to the book of Ephesians, and I'll ask you to do that with me for a moment, chapter 2. And go down in Ephesians chapter 2 to verse 6. 
And Ephesians 2, 6 is a verse that's conveying that union we have with Christ, similar to what we already talked about in Galatians 2, 20, where Paul said there, I have been crucified with Christ. And Romans chapter 6, where he spoke about being put to death with Christ and raised up with Christ. And here he says, we are raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's right there right now. His presence there and our union with him that God established according to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 in eternity past represents the fact that he is there on our behalf. These truths concerning Christ and his presence in the immediate presence of the Father and our union with him by virtue of God's choice and God's grace should bring great comfort to all of God's people. He will return to judge men and angels at the end of the world. Look in your Bibles. I'll give you a reference not necessarily listed there. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's listed specifically here. It's not. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. Again, another one of Paul's messages. <clears throat> he says, because he has fixed, that is, God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. God will judge the sins of all people through Jesus Christ, that those that are not in Christ, that have no union with him, that have not believed in him, they will be cast into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. Let's go to number five. The Lord Jesus, by his perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself, which he through the eternal spirit once offered up unto God, hath fully satisfied the justice of God, procured reconciliation, and purchased an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those whom the Father hath given to him. Christ perfectly obeyed the Father. He gave himself as a sacrifice. We've looked at multiple verses with regard to that. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 with me, verse 14. He gave himself as an offering through the eternal spirit to God. Hebrews 9 and 14. How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You can jump over as well to chapter uh, 10 and verse 14 of Hebrews. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Why is the writer of Hebrews using the phrase, therefore, by one offering? He is, isn't he? And in that old system, were things taken care of with one offering? 
That's right. Many lambs, as Walter said, many lambs at one time, or many lambs at one time, and say the rest of it again. And then offering many times. That's right, frequently. Literally, innumerable numbers of sacrifices. None of which, according to Hebrews, removed sin, did they? Because they were not intended to remove sin. The intention was to look forward to the one who would, right? And Christ, in one sacrifice, accomplished God's purpose. Romans chapter 3, verse 25 and 26. whom God displayed publicly, that is Christ, as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus." And actually, whenever we get into the next paragraph, we're going to look a little more closely at that verse. It's a very powerful text. Um, John 17 and verse 2. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And again, to and the emphasis there on all that the Father had given him. Hebrews chapter 9 again, the next verse, verse 15. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. And what a praise it is that God's people do receive the promise of the eternal inheritance, don't they? Peter refers to it as an inheritance that is in heaven, an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, an inheritance that does not fade away, that's reserved in heaven for us, doesn't he? So important that we as believers understand that. That's from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. He's given that inheritance, as their document says here, for all those whom the Father hath given unto him. And again, we're back to the election, aren't we, in that? You know, isn't it interesting, just a side thought here, question for thought, isn't it an interesting truth that that doctrine of election is repeated multiple times all through the New Testament, but one that is not addressed often today, generally speaking. And when it is, it's just kind of jumped over quickly or redefined redefined somewhat like this. Oh yes, God has elected you. He's chosen all those who will choose Him or that He knows will choose Him. In other words, the power 
of the righteousness of God, Luther actually called the, the, the satisfaction of God's wrath in Christ, the righteousness of God, and that, that God has done that, not us. He has satisfied his wrath. And it's de redefined to imply we have satisfied his wrath through our belief. That's normally how, to some extent, you will hear election defined today. Unbiblical. Christ is our propitiation, isn't he? This document says that he has satisfied the justice of God, and he has done so according to this document, and especially according to Scripture, fully, right? 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 refers to him, to Christ, as the propitiation, right? For our sins. Again, in 1 John 4, 10, he's the one who's the propitiation. He has propitiated God. He has satisfied God's wrath on our behalf. Very quickly, let's take a look at this paragraph here for a moment. It answers the question with regard to what about all those people who lived before Christ came and died on the cross? What about all their sins? Number six, Although the price of redemption was not actually paid by Christ till after his incarnation, in other words, he had to become a man, right? And he had to, as a man, die on the cross, and in that death God is propitiated. Yet the virtue, efficacy, and benefit thereof were communed to the elect, were communicated to the elect in all ages, successfully from the beginning of the world, in and by those promises, types, sacrifices, wherein he was revealed and signified to be the seed which would bruise the serpent's head. They're going clear back to Genesis 3, 15, aren't they? Immediately after sin had entered the world, and there God addressing the serpent and giving that first promise concerning Christ, the first written promise concerning Christ. And the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, being the same yesterday and today and forever. The Lamb slain. Notice that as they refer to it here, from the foundation of the world. That's a reference to Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. Now, if you go and read Revelation 13, 8, take a look at the text with me. Is there a difference in the verse and what we just read in this document? Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, that is, the Antichrist, the beast, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. What's the difference between the document that you're looking at and the verse? Now, if you have a King James Version, you can't use that right now <laughs> because it's, it quotes it like the document here does before us, the confession. The difference basically is where and to what in the verse are they attaching the phrase from the foundation of the earth. The New American Standard, the ESV, attach it to those whose names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The King James, the New International Version, and others attach it to the Lamb slain. 
And that's why you end up in those translations with a differing one. Some commentators believe that the most accurate translation is as conveyed here in this document and also in the King James and communicates the Greek more precisely, putting the emphasis on Christ having been slain from before the foundation of the earth. As a matter of fact, they will appeal to another text, chapter 17. Those who hold to this translation, if you jump over to chapter 17, verse 8, you see something else repeated here. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Some say it needs to be uh, the foundation of the earth needs to be trans or com um, connected to the names written because it is in chapter 17, 8. Well, here's the truth of it. Christ was, insofar as God was concerned, crucified when? That's right. That was no new news to God, was it? The crucifixion of Christ was the, as we've already examined, was the experience of God's decree, wasn't it? It was already in his mind. You can actually look in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. He really, I believe, conveys to us here, God does through his Holy Spirit, that fact that Christ was crucified from the foundation of the world. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 19. I just wanted to touch on that in case there was a question with regard to the differences in those translations. 1 Peter chapter 1 Verse 19 says, But with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So is it also true that the elect were written in the book from the foundation, so are both statements true? Yes, they are. If you go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, just as he chose us in him from when? Before the foundation of 1, 4. Yeah, before the foundation of the world, we were chosen. Go back to Romans with me briefly, chapter 3. In Romans 3, we're looking at verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So how is the righteousness of God now manifested? Well, first of all, notice, it was witnessed by the law and the prophets, wasn't it? And what Paul means there is that Christ's coming and his death and God's forgiveness of his people's sin in Christ, the prophets prophesied of it and the law spoke of it. They were witnesses to it. As a matter of fact, who was it that appeared to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Peter, James, and John were with him, but two people appeared there with Christ. Moses and Elijah. Moses represented the law. Elijah, the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. 
whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. And notice this, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. All those folks in the Old Testament, God passed over their sin because he was waiting for Christ, wasn't he? To propitiate his wrath. He had also judged their sins in Christ. The document says, Yet the virtue, efficacy, and benefit thereof were communicated to the elect in all ages, successfully from the beginning of the world, in and by those promises. God gave them the promises, and they knew it. There was a Redeemer coming. And so whenever they sacrificed, and if they were sacrificing in line with God's law, they were doing so looking forward, weren't they? For the coming of the one who would remove their sin. I believe in the Old Testament that those who understood that, the Old Testament indicates that there were those who understood it. There were those in the Old Testament who did not understand it. And they thought, as some in the New Testament did, that by doing the sacrifice, it saves you. But rather, you should be doing the sacrifice because you already are a person of faith, right? We obey not to be saved, but because we are. We obey out of faith. They would have obeyed out of faith as well. David put it this way. Remember when he was confessing his sin? In Psalm 51, sacrifice and offering you would not. That's a profound statement coming from someone in the Old Testament who was a Jew, especially the king. Paul told Saul, or excuse me, Samuel told Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. Any questions or comments before we close this evening? Well, that's a lot in this document, and we still haven't finished it. We've got a few more paragraphs in this section, but this, I believe, is a loaded section dealing, obviously, with our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you indeed for our Savior, and what a Savior He is. Calls our minds to stretch around these truths and hold them dear to our hearts that we may have a more full understanding of Your Word and will and especially of Christ Jesus, our Savior. In His name we pray. Amen.